How y'all doing? Donald here today, and we're going to talk about object relational mapping libraries. Uh, two of the videos that I have about to come up uh, this week are uh, about two different object relational packages in Go. So I figured it'd be a good idea to actually explain what an object relational library is and what it do. But let me show you that. Uh, so we have this little these little notes I wrote out here. So. Before we discuss what those are, maybe we should ask, what the hell does ORM stand for? ORM stands for Object Relational Map. Now, what this typically means is that you're wanting to interact with a system by means other than which the normal way is that you interact with it. So, an example, as I see here, um, an example would be, let's say you have a SQL database and you're wanting to interact with your database uh, in something that's not SQL. So like maybe just whatever code you're writing in your program, as in my case, as, as my videos are, it'd be Go. And this, what an ORM does is, it, is the mechanism by which it allows you to use your code, like Go code, Python code, whatever, to somehow interact with the database without actually writing and submitting SQL queries. So how does that work? Well, wh what it actually does is you, you'll, you'll usually have some kind of data type defined, right? So a struct, a class, something like that. And this class or the struct is meant to represent, and we're primarily talking about SQL databases, even though there are some ORMs that are meant to be used with non-SQL databases like Mongo. Um, in the case of SQL, uh, uh, one of these types would, rep would represent a, um, a table, for example. So if I had a user class or a user struct, this would represent a like user's table in my database. And all of the properties on that class would kind of match up one-to-one -one usually with the columns in the table. And by doing it this way, what we enables doing is, and I have this little snippet of Go code here in my markdown file, that you would, and this is not taken from any ORM by the way, this is kind of like a representation of what would happen, is you would access your user's model and then call some kind of method that uh, when it's actually running, so you, when you run this method, you'll get back, if, if it exists, you know, an actual populated uh, Go struct. Uh, but you didn't write any SQL query. Uh, but behind the scenes, what's happened is it's taken this and generated something like this. It's generated an actual select statement um, since we're interacting with users. Uh, select star from users where ID equals one. And then it's taken that result, um, unmarshaled it into your struct and returned the struct without you having to actually write uh, any SQL query yourself. So that's the basic gist of what an ORM does and why you'd want to use it. Um, now let's see the, the pros and cons of ORMs because it's not all just pros. Um, you will most notably spend less time having to, have to spend less time to actually interact with your database. Instead of having to sit there and write out the actual queries, you're just going to be interacting with you know, your code. Uh, most likely, you also taking advantage of any kind of you know, plugins or any IDE features that do auto completion and type checking and things like that. Um, also, these libraries tend to abstract away what database it is that you're interacting with. Um, as in the case of these, most of these are kind of SQL oriented. A lot of these are compatible with most major uh, SQL databases that are used. So. Even if you can have the same code and interact with a MySQL database, or it could be interacting with a SQLite file, a uh, Postgres database, a SQL Server database, uh, your code basically wouldn't change. The only thing that would probably change is the configuration part of it. Um, the other advantage of this is if, you, if you're not very, really that savvy with SQL, or you have kind of weak SQL skills, my face is in the way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, this will allow you to interact with them and even set them up without not having without having to actually do them yourself. And oftentimes if you if you're not really good at writing SQL queries, the generated queries from the library are 
at least that good, if not probably better than the ones that you would write if you're just not very confident about writing C++. So what are the, what are the cons we got here? Um, the, the, while the generated queries tend to be, you know, basically fine for most cases, um, if you're needing a extremely, maybe you have like a really complex query you need and you need it like very highly optimized, uh, you probably need to write it yourself instead of actually using the library. Most libraries give you the ability to just run like arbitrary raw queries when you need to do it. Um, so that would be one of those cases where you'd probably just still need to actually interact with it yourself. Um, and an ORM library is like any library. Um, there is some amount of overhead in relation to like learning how the ORM works, um, how to use it to accomplish various goals that you may want to do. Um, they all require, there's, there's some kind of startup relating to configuring everything. You, you may run the issues getting it configured to work in the first place. So you know, kind of, that kind of depends on you. And also, uh, while it does allow you to interact with the database and even you know, set things up uh, probably schema-wise with it, if you're doing this, chances are you're not actually directly interacting with it. And if you have weak SQL skills, you're most likely not going to be getting any better at it because you're just always interacting with it through code rather than uh, like actual SQL query. So if you're wanting to get better at it, uh, you might want to still do some of your own like uh, database interactions rather than just always relying on the ORM. So, there actually, people may not actually realize this, there's two primary types of ORMs that I have seen. Uh, there may be more. Uh, if, you, if, if there is another one that I'm not stating here, uh, be sure to let me know in the comments down below or wherever uh, if I am not aware of one. And the two that I'm aware of are code first and schema first. Now, code first, um, as the name implies, you write the code by, by yourself, and then the library will read your code, typically, you get classes or structs, and infer from that information a schema that needs to be, uh, one, probably applied to a database, because uh, we'll get into that in a minute, uh, but it'll know, like, okay, if I have a user struct, and I'm calling a certain method on this struct, what it actually means is, hey, connect to this database and run this query on this table, things like that. Um, some examples of code first ORMs is uh, there's a really popular one in Go called uh, Go ORM, where I like to call it GORM. That sounds better. Uh, and then I think there's other ones, but that's like probably one of the most used ones. And then basically every single ORM used in most mainstream frameworks are code first. Um, the ORM that is used in Laravel, which is a PHP framework called Eloquence, that's code first. Uh, Active Record, which is used by Ruby on Rails, is code first. Whatever the hell the thing is called that Django uses is code first. These are all code first approaches because you are writing the code in your system and then you use that code to generate and interact with a database schema. Now, the other way, and I see far less of these, it's called a schema-first ORM. And with a schema-first ORM, you, you have an existing database schema already defined, whether it's because it's, it, it's a database that's been around or you just prefer to just define it yourself. And the library will uh, read over the database schema and from the database schema definition will generate all of the code, or most, if not all, the code that you would need to interact with the database. And I don't see very many of these. Um, the only ones I've interacted with before was like a kind of like an in-house built code, like a lab, PHP library that uh, was at a job I worked at that basically was this. Now I know this is a thing. And then there's this one called SQL Boiler, which is, uh, this is actually one of the videos is gonna be on. The two videos that are gonna, I'm gonna have up uh, sometime this week are ones on G GORM and other ones on SQL Boiler. Now, we know there's two different types, kind of two different classifications of ORMs. 
why would you pick one over the other? Okay. Um, code first. Uh, in my experience, as I mentioned, there, the, uh, most ORMs are code first. So if you're wanting a lot of choices, uh, you definitely want code first. Um, also, code first ORMs tend to do a lot more than just simply generating code from schema. Um, they'll do, maybe they have some basic boiler plating, uh, which is kind of more along the lines of what, say, uh, active, what Rails does, where you can generate like boilerplate models and then kind of fill out the rest yourself. Uh, if, if you um, don't, again, are not wanting to have to interact with the database much or uh, do the schema changes yourself. I just realized my face is in the way again. Um, also, a lot of times these libraries have mechanisms built in to uh, generate uh, database migrations for you and then apply them for you rather than you having to do it yourself or use a separate tool. Uh, schema first RRMs. Um, if you are going to have to start interacting with a database that you are. Uh, uh, like I didn't have to interact with before, uh, you will probably want to do that. Oops, or let me go up here. Yeah, okay. Uh, because you know you may not know a lot about the database itself, um, and it may actually be faster just to say, "Hey, we have to pick up and start using this database now." Uh, just then, you just point your library at it, and say, "Okay, just." generate the code for it for me and and then you can just kind of look over it and look over the entire database schema yourself that way um this is extremely helpful if you are suddenly having to pick up and interact with like a legacy system or legacy data and it did not have an orm at all it was just uh writing a uh, raw sql queries uh, i have bad experiences with this um also if you would prefer to have the schema defined some other way, whether it's through a separate tool or you do it yourself, and you don't want to write a single line of code, mostly, and you just want all the code to be generated for you and use it, uh, this is probably the better approach. Uh, most, the, the SQL boiler thing that I'm going to do a video on, uh, this, this is basically what it does. If, if you point at a schema, it reads it, boom, you probably don't have to write any code. You've got code ready to go. And uh, as I said, if you kind of prefer a more uh, piece by piece, a piecemeal approach, like a Unix approach to uh, tooling, uh, this is probably better. Uh, the couple of these uh, schema driven ones that I've seen, like that's primarily just what they do, right? They act as an abstraction layer over your database and generate the code for you to do that and then stop. Like that's what they do. They don't do this thing where they don't allow, they don't like do this stuff with migrations. Um, they may not even do things relating to books. They might, I don't know. It depends on the library. Uh, and if you're wanting to do migrations, like handle migrations with some kind of tooling too, you'll have to take another tool and use it to do migrations separate, which some people prefer that. If you, again, if you kind of prefer the more Unix approach, which is, uh, each thing does one thing and does it well, then you may prefer this type of library over the code first type of library. Uh, so that's my quick little summary explanation of what an ORM library is and why you may want to use it, not want to use it, and the different types of it. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, later this week, you will get a you will get a overview of both a code first. ORM and a schema first ORM. So be sure to be subscribed and you will know when those upload. Um, with that, uh, y'all come on back now and I'll see you next time.